Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm really excited for this talk because I sometimes fly to America and use Uber, as I call it, public transport there. <laughs> and uh, I'm really interested in Lucy's talk, migrating two million CPU cores to Kubernetes. So welcome, Lucy. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I'm Lucy. I'm an engineer over at Uber in uh, Denmark. Well, so I work in the uh, Denmark office of Uber, which probably most people in this room have never even heard of. But uh, we have 120 people in a small Danish city called Aarhus, and we build um, all of the stateful and stateless platforms that are used across the company. And so the, the, TLDR, the long and short of our job is that we, ex we exist to make other developers not have to care about their infrastructure and hosting, and they can just focus on getting working code and move on with their lives. Um, and we have a lot of infrastructure, actually. Uh, I think most of you will know what Uber is already, especially if you're from America. Uh, but um, so it translates to a huge amount of uh, stuff. We're doing, uh, what is it? We're counting trips nowadays in like billions of trips we do. Uh, and then under the hood from that, we have 4,500 microservices uh, being deployed out by about uh, many, I can't remember now, it's like many thousands of engineers. Um, and they all do this through this uh, up platform. Um, up is meant to uh, be the go-to platform for all of the stateless services at Uber. You can deploy onto it, and then we will deal with your infrastructure and et cetera. Uh, we're strong believers in, or up will deploy it for you if you're using continuous deployment, which we're strong believers in, which is why we have about 31,000 uh, weekly deployments to production. So it uh, adds up to a lot. Uh, so, oh, that's annoying, that image broke. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So under the hood, um, the w so the way, the, the way up works is that service owners will tell us um, what their requirements are in terms of how many containers they need, uh, what sort of placement uh, options they need, how many, uh, how, what CPU and memory requirements they have, what underlying hosts they need. They might ask, need, might need specific GPUs. A lot of these images are actually broken. Uh, a lot of, may, they might need specific, uh, yeah, images, GPUs, uh, and we will uh, take and we take that. And we apply it, and, and we apply it to all of the clusters across Uber, uh, based on decisions we make. The idea is that service owners can give us quite basic, high-level goal states for what they want their service to look like, and then we will translate that into something uh, much more in-depth specification uh, for what we will actually deploy across our fleet, based on policy and based on what they've asked us for. Um, so. I'm actually going to just refresh this tab to see if I can get the images to return. <laughs> Ta-da! Um, <laughs> yeah, see, this is why I'm a senior software engineer. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so previously, uh, Up has been uh, using a system we built called Peloton, which is built on Mesos, uh, back in about 2017. We looked at using Kubernetes, and we uh, Saw some people showing like, hey, we've built, we've managed to get this cluster going with like, it took us a load of hacks and it's like really broken, but we managed to get a thousand hosts on this Kubernetes cluster, and we looked at that blog post in 2017 and we looked at our like 10,000 servers and we decided, yeah, maybe not, uh, maybe now's not the time, so we ended up using our own system built on Mesos, but over time, obviously, Kubernetes has got better and better. Uh, we saw more smaller medium companies pick it up. We saw half the Fortune 500 have picked it up now. Um, and uh, Mesos has, uh, it's, it became harder to reach out to uh, the maintainers of Mesos or to maintain it at all. It became a bit uh, dated, and we were also finding it quite hard to actually get specialized knowledge in Mesos. So we ended up deciding that we were going to move to Kubernetes. Um, when we were moving, we uh, had some pretty key requirements. We wanted this to be something that is touchless, so something that our engineers uh, in America and all over the world don't really notice is happening, and they don't, it doesn't require disruption to their service. Um, it's uh, something where we wanted to be able to do it bit by bit, rather than just a huge leap of faith. So we wanted to be able to run both uh, the old system and the new system side by side, and gradually shift um, our infrastructure bit by bit onto Kubernetes. And yeah, and we didn't want our engineers to have to do anything. So when we thought about that, we thought that there's uh, we're going to have to uh, define what we need to do to actually do this migration in that way. And we ended up, coming up, we ended up saying that it's this idea of portability. And portability, uh, the idea is that 
the services across Uber then become uh, independent from the orchestrator they're on and the host that they're on. Previously, this may not have been the case for quite a lot of services, and that was a lot, big story in its own right. Um, but, portab but portability is uh, portability is super important because it means that we can. Um, it means a few things. It means we can do this migration touchless, as I said, where we can just shift people to the new orchestrator without them having to do anything or notice. It means that services don't have to come down and come back up because services can, would be resilient to uh, working on the new orchestrator and we just should work out the box. And it also means we can do more migration in the future. We didn't want to just build this portability concept once, use it to migrate to Kubernetes, uh, never enforce it again, and the next time if we want to move to, I don't know, in like 12 years, Kubernetes 2 or whatever the heck that is, um, that we'd have to use it again. Uh, that's already come in useful. We're also migrating from on-prem to uh, multiple cloud providers, and we're using this same portability concept there. So portability is built of two things, really. Uh, movement tolerance, which is the I idea that we can move services between different orchestrators and different platforms without uh, it causing disruption. That's one end. And also, it's a uh, concept of distributability that we can have uh, services running on, diff on different hosts, and those services, as long as the hosts are within the bounds of what that service needs, for example, if it's a GPU service that needs like an RTX 5000, then it will get that. It shouldn't matter what host, in what rack, in what data center that's on. Um, so that took uh, quite a while, but we got all of our service to a state where they were portable, and that meant we could uh, move on to the uh, migration. So, this is roughly what our actual platform looks like. Uh, a long time ago, before we moved to Kubernetes, this would have all been Peloton clusters across here. But it's, right now, it's a mix. This is actually shows it half and half. It's more like 80%, 90% Kubernetes, 10% Peloton now. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of stuff now. We've got, uh, yeah, I think I just updated that number today, 2.7 million CPU cores uh, across our fleet. Uh, they're distributed in multiple regions. So one of our regions is the US East Coast, one's the US West Coast. There's a region in Korea for complicated laws they have that's kind of like GDPR light. Um, and inside each region, there are multiple availability zones. And you could think about those similar to an AWS availability zone or like, a, it, it's, um, or like a one data center. The idea is that availability zones, one going down shouldn't mean the others go down in the same region. And then inside each zone, we can have uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters, multiple Peloton clusters. They could be on-prem, they could be on Oracle Cloud, they could be on Google Cloud. Um, it, it depends. Um, and then where we slotted in Kubernetes in this is we always end up, we always had, we always expressed uh, the concepts of what, of what we were wanting to deploy in quite abstract and generic ways in terms of we had the idea of an up of a job and then a pod. And before that would be translated into Peloton commands, which would then run on Mesos through the Peloton backend. And we just slotted in a new backend uh, called the Kubernetes backend, which, did, which took those same generic types from before, so the whole system didn't have to be rebuilt. And it then translated them into Kubernetes specifications that were then pushed to our Kubernetes clusters. Um, but it wasn't just as simple as that. Um, we've had, there were a lot of challenges, but I'm going to go through a few. Um, We've had, we had some issues with risk, we had some with uh, reperformance, we had some container snapshots. So let's talk about uh, risk. So one of the big risks we had is we didn't want midway through this migration to cause a big incident. Um, and so there's two sides to how we made sure that we reduce risk in this. The first one is how up controls the rate of change when it deploys services. So in some places before I've seen, uh, the uh, head of the mainline uh, of source code is reflected as quickly as possible across infrastructure. And that's great in that you get immediate feedback, but if you break something, then you get immediate feedback when your service goes down. Uh, we, our system is a bit more complex. Uh, we, well, a bit more complex. Um, so what up does when service owners make a deploy request is, they tell us what they need, so CPU RAM topology, et cetera. Uh, we look at their actual state across the fleet, uh, not just against Kubernetes here, but against Peloton too, uh, across all of our clusters. We take those together and we diff out what's different between what they asked for and what is actually running right now. We then take those changes and we 
and we turn them into a set of steps that we need to do to go from the current state to the state that the user has requested. Each step is then an operation, and it's a set of gates that decide whether that operation was successful. So in this case, for example, I've got a step here, update the deployment spec on this Kubernetes cluster, uh, and the gates for it are that the new container is deployed, alerts didn't fire, and we wait 10 minutes to make sure the alerts aren't just going to fire a minute after it's deployed, for example, when it got requests. Um, oh, that should... No? Okay, that works, okay. Yeah, so this is actually what that looks like in our uh, system. Uh, you can see here these, these steps have already finished running, and then this one is running right now. It's upgrading this uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster copy of the service, and it's going to then watch its alerts. It's going to wait for about two minutes, and it's going to check that the instances become reachable in this thing called UNS that I won't go into. Um, if something goes wrong, for example, I start rolling out my service, I apply this step here, to apply the new service version with a gate, the container is healthy, and that gate fails because the container is not healthy at all. Uh, then we perform a rollback, and damn it, let me just, uh, if I do this, maybe, ooh, hey, <laughs> they should give me a promotion. Uh, anyway, so when we do that, we build these, uh, we end up doing these rollback steps. So. When we roll back, we look at all the steps that we have executed or began executing, because we only execute steps one by one, and we generate a rollback step for them, which is based on the previous state of the system, which we saved before when we assessed what we were going to change. Uh, so in this case here, this is rolling back. So all of these steps that have already ran have got corresponding rollback steps that are going to bring them back on the clusters where we change stuff to the state they were in before. That normally solves the problem. Of course, if the existing setup was already broken, then there's not really much we can do. But most of the time, changes, changes are what actually caused the bugs to appear. Um, so yeah, so the rollback step is then to apply the previous service version. That runs. And then we're back to healthy. Um, the other thing we do to make this migration a bit less risky is service tiering. So inside of Uber, all of our services are given a tier, and a tier essentially indicates how important the service is to the business. So at the high end, we've got tier five, which it doesn't really matter at all. I know that there's a bot that runs an internal foosball league in that tier. Um, and on tier zero, we've got if a tier zero service is down, then the app just doesn't work. So the, it says critical path here. We say, when we say critical path, we mean the minimum set of things that need to be up for you to just be able to request a ride, get in the car, get to your destination, get out. Um, and obviously, if those are down, then people can't earn a living, which sucks. So, um, so when we performed our migration, we started with these higher tier services first. And so, uh, there, were, there is actually an image there of a Kubernetes logo, but you're just going to have to pretend it's there. Um, we started with the, oh, hello. Uh, we started with these higher tier services first. And then that gave us confidence that, and then they were effectively uh, the first ones that soaked on Kubernetes. They were where we ended up finding uh, bugs in our placement logic or bugs in uh, how we did this migration, because of course nothing's error free. And then as we got more confident, we moved down and down through the lower tiers until we had everyone onboarded. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's, how, that's basically how we worked on reducing risk. But there's also some uh, features that engineers at Uber are quite used to that we had to bring along with us, one of which is container snapshotting. Uh, a lot of engineers at Uber debug their uh, failed services by looking at container snapshots. Uh, they look at the service logs, but they also look at what, is, what was on the file system Sorry, when, uh, when their container crashed to understand what, what went wrong. Right now, on, sorry, before on Peloton, they could just access that really easily because Peloton keeps all of the container artifacts for a really long time before getting rid of them. Obviously, Kubernetes is a bit more efficient and cleans up quite well, um, so we had to do something here. What we ended up doing was we built our own artifact uploader and had that upload to a blob store we have called TerraBlob uh, on container exit. How that looks is it's a sidecar container on uh, each of the pods that we run on Kubernetes. That sidecar container waits, waits uh, for the pod above it to exit, and before that it can exit, it stops the pod, snapshots it, takes that snapshot, pushes it to the blob store, and then it allows the pod to uh, kill itself and go away. 
uh, that then means that end users can, out of way, can go on our uh, blob store and get their container snapshot, and uh, they're not uh, mad at us for taking away a feature. Uh, <laughs> Uh, other thing we found is that we send a lot of requests to uh, our clusters, uh, both engineers and the platform itself, to assess the state of everything. Uh, particularly on Kubernetes, uh, most of the requests we get are things like, tell me about every container for this service, which, in the set, which has to mean that you then have to branch out to every single cluster every time you do that, because you, you need to make sure that you capture everything. Uh, we found that when we did this on the test cluster, uh, etcd started stressing out. So we ended, up having, we ended up having to put a shimmy in the middle. So we put this little, uh, there is a person in, that, there in the missing image. There, we ended up putting this service in the middle. Uh, it has an informer on all our clusters, so it then becomes, instead of a pulling-based system, it becomes a push-based system. Uh, events, go into this in, events go into this system. They get indexed in there as well, which is quite nice. Um, and then users make requests to that, and that's where they serve their data from. Obviously, that means that this system is not necessarily up to date with the actual source truth on the cluster. Um, so the way that we ended up fixing for that is luckily our servers are really synchronized NTP-wise, like within 0.01 seconds or something like that. So we just use time. I know resource version exists. I know it's a number. I know that maintainers keep saying do not use it as a number, even though it's the etcd resource version underneath. But um, we ended up using uh, time instead because it's just a lot easier for our, especially when our NTP clocks are synchronized, it's just a lot easier for end users to just put, just give me data from right now and then to wait for uh, that data to come in. Uh, okay, so putting this all together, this is actually what it looks like in our production system. So say I am over here, this is my test service that is currently not on Kubernetes at all. Um, the cluster would say Kubernetes if it was, it's on the system called Peloton. So I am going to try and migrate it to Kubernetes. I just have to type the service name in. Okay, default. Oh, no, not Peloton. Kubernetes only. Yeah, make it larger, sorry. Uh, that could, really, I, I'm not signed in, so you're gonna watch me sign in now. <laughs> uh, Am I going to be allowed to sign in? Hopefully I am. Let's see. <laughs> I am now signed. I thought I signed in earlier. Apparently not. OK. So uh, the command itself isn't important. OK. So now if I refresh here. So now this service, it's doing uh, what I said before. It's looking at the uh, current state of the service across our fleet. It's looking at what I just asked it to do, which is move it to Kubernetes. And it's generated all of these uh, pl all of these steps here that it's going to execute. So the first one here is it's doing a thing called make before break, where it's going to make all of the new containers on Kubernetes, and then it's going to delete the old ones from the old uh, Peloton system. If this break, so in the end of that, you end up with something that looks like uh, this. This is one I made earlier. Um, for the record, those aren't like timestamps from when it started. I just did. I just made sure this worked at midnight last night. So you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, always prepared. Um, so then you can see it's uh, created all the things on the Kubernetes and dropped them from Peloton. And as I said before, if something goes wrong and we need to roll back, it will look at the steps that it's already started doing. It will uh, take that. It will make corresponding rollback steps for those, and then roll back onto Peloton. Is this going to work? I hit the button. Let's see. Did I actually hit the button? Yes, now I did. Okay, now it likes me. Do, do, do. And now it's creating corresponding steps for the things that it did do to roll back onto Peloton, so it's coming off of Kubernetes now. So yeah, th that's how the system works. Um, and so, uh, next slide. No, I don't want to play the contingency video. So, <laughs> so what did we learn at Uber? So, Kubernetes wasn't the silver bullet that's the be-all, end-all solution to all of our problems forever, uh, I wish. Uh, <laughs> we had to build a lot of stuff on top, especially because there was a lot of making the system feel and look like the old system and bringing across old environment IDs and uh, old behaviors from the old system. Uh, there were also a few features on Kubernetes that just didn't, ex that didn't exist for our use cases, so we used a lot, we used a lot of uh, CRDs to do this. Um, but that flexibility, was super useful to us. 
Uh, it's not, Kubernetes isn't very opinionated about what you run on it. You could run, any, you could run pretty much anything. You don't even have to run services on top of Kubernetes. In fact, there's a few people in our company now who are, um, who are just using uh, Kubernetes for things like, uh, what is it, they're using an operator to do uh, network routing uh, and things like that. Um, and that flexibility is super cool to us. And it, and it uh, what is it, it, ma it, makes, it makes this a whole lot easier. Um, and the first million calls were the easiest. Uh, most services were pretty basic, didn't have a dependence on the uh, underlying systems, weren't exotic in any way. But we found that uh, a lot of our end users had built a lot of dependencies on documented and very much undocumented features of our uh, old system. Uh, one of the ones that annoyed me the most was uh, that some people had, some people had realized that um, some people, had, some people didn't want to do leader elections, so they'd realized that the first container of their service always had dash one on the end of the host name, so they were directly reading the host name and looking for that dash one to actually do anything. That was annoying. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they use actual leader elections now, and uh, they, don't, they can't do that anymore because we don't expose that behavior anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, but no, but um, our ability to move services uh, bit by bit and to very easily roll back because we're doing these small changes. It, the lack that it reduced the risk significantly so that we weren't having to effectively do these big leap of faith changes where we just move the service and if it broke, we're just screwed. Um, so in terms of the migration status, uh, we're pretty much there now. We're like 88% done. Uh, we've got uh, some pretty big clusters, about 5,000 nodes. It's not that we, would, we couldn't go over 5,000 nodes, it's just that we don't really want to get into the packy territory of running huge clusters, uh, especially when we've got prod on it. Uh, so we can, we're probably gonna stay, stay around there and just flesh out more clusters if we have to. Um, our largest clusters now, yeah, are about 50,000 pods and 7,000 deployments across 5,500 nodes. Uh, the nodes won't go up from there, hopefully, but we'll see. Um, yep, and... Uh, We've, so now we've, we've moved our stateless fleet to Kubernetes. We have a load more stuff. We have our stateful stuff, which is up next, which obviously has its own very unique challenges. And uh, do come talk to me if you want to hear me about that. And also I'll be at the Contributor Summit on Tuesday uh, saying about that as well. Uh, and the, we also have our batch workloads yeah, and daemon set workloads, but they will be uh, moved eventually. So a lot of stuff to go. And uh, yeah, and that's it. There are QR codes there. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is uh, basically where we are in our migration journey. Uh, thank you for listening. And yeah, any questions? Let me fix. Oh, are these QR codes going to come up now? There we are. Cool. <laughs>
Uh, I'm curious, like, were all engineers directly uh, querying the Kubernetes API, or did you have any sort of backend where you also were able to get that data from it was, like it an was observability or anything like that? It was a mix of both. Uh, so every time, for example, if I get back here, when I'm on this page on the front end, uh, this is having to query every cluster to work out where I'm running, for example. But also there's, um, there's a few things, for example, to optimize how many CPU and memory footprint you have, for example, things like that. And there's another one that looks at how much your service is costing us. And they're all also doing big scans across everything. And all in all, that's what en ended up adding up to cause us to go, OK, we can't just do direct reads against etcd, or we're going to cause issues. OK, another, another question. Um, congratulations on the milestone, firstly, um, migrating that. But um, you've stated that common resources like deployments and stuff weren't feasible for you. Could you get, go with an example? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the so one of the things that a lot we do is uh, what we call uh, in, pla in place upgrades, uh, and uh, one of the parts of that is uh, prefetching. So. So one of the things that we found particularly annoying about the default behavior on Kubernetes is that you upgrade to a new image uh, of a service. Uh, the, the, new, the, new pod, the new pod has to basically wait for a really long time to pull the image, especially when uh, this is more for the exotic services. But there were definitely services I saw that had like tw insane like 20 gigabyte image, images. <laughs> and that would, take us, that would take so long to come up that our system was like, it's not coming up. It must be unhealthy. Um, so one of the things our CRD does, for example, is it prefetches a new image before starting the rollout of the next version of the service. Uh, behaviors like this. There's also some stuff that I can talk about a bit more, maybe if you want, about uh, uh, C groups and things. But we'll get into that. <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about that as well at the contributor summit. Anyway. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, so you touched upon this a little bit, but I see like the portability stage was probably the most taxing. Mm -hmm because you probably had to deal with other <laughs> um, uh, teams. Yeah. <laughs> Could you go into more detail of how you actually dealt with that? It seems yeah. like 80% of the groups were already portable, were using 12-factor app and what have you, but mm -hmm. it's the yeah. next 20%, which is the most difficult. Yeah, so the way we approach portability is the first thing we did is we marked every service as uh, not portable, and we started, uh, we used the fact that we have this gradual change system and we used a very similar thing to the Kubernetes thing, where each service had a portable, portable or not portable flag. And if you marked it as portable, it would make sure it was distributed across multiple machines to see, is it really portable? Uh, we used that same concept for the portability drive. We start everyone as not portable. We, moved, we, we made a change to say that you are, saw if it got rolled back. If it got rolled back, you went onto a long tail of services we need to look into more. Um, once you're on that long tail, it was mostly, it depended on the service, but there was mostly like a grouping of, um, things it could be. It was dependence on host. It was something about latency. And we, we just had to work with service owners to get that through. It required a lot of buy-in from leadership because it pulled people off of, uh, you know, rather than improving their end product, they're now having to spend ages uh, building a new leader election system because they were using a hack before. Um, but no, in the end, it was, it was definitely so worth it because not only is it the resilience point, but I mean, yeah, we're also migrating all of our stuff to cloud providers right now, and we don't have to really do anything because... Oh, sorry, we don't have to really moan at any service owner anymore because they're, they're all uh, resilient to both their control plane and the host they're on. Okay, um, one question regards networking. So how you achieve to switch over load balanced uh, from old workload to new workload? Uh, the, the switch over from what, sorry? From the old system workload to the new system workload. How you switched over the network traffic and so on. Oh, yes. So. Um, so that is done by a system called Mutley, uh, and what it and what and Mutley is basically like the load balancer that sits in front of services. I can actually can I see it on here? I probably can for my test service. So ah, of course I can't. Okay, let me actually get a real service then. Uh, this is the one that does the re-performance thing I said about. Uh, so Mutley looks across uh, all of your uh, clusters across our fleet, and it it works in a similar concept to how I said about up, where there's a generic. Uh, there's generic representations that then get translated from both Peloton and Kubernetes, right? Uh, Mutley then builds that. Mutley then discovers where you're running. It builds out this big group here, and then when requests come in for your service, they get distributed across there. There's also some other stuff here. There's like a restrict region thing, and that just basically means that when it can, you'll stay in the same region because that's cool for latency. But that's how we. Does that, does that answer your question? Cool. 
Yeah, this is all us. This is all, yeah, all we built it. Yeah, I know. Look, we've got open source stuff too. If you use Zap, that's us. Anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more questions? Are you planning to release this as open source, your IDP? Or? Okay, so this is a long thing. <laughs> so I want to, there's also some other people who want to. What basically ends up happening is we go, wouldn't it be awesome to open source this? And then we go, yeah. And then we go, okay, so who's going to flesh it out from the, you know, the Uber repo and turn it into an open source product? And everyone goes, not me. <laughs> uh, we have one question, just a second. Not a real question, though, but could you put up the last slide with the QR codes again? Yes, I can. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. Uh, do the images work? Yes, they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. A part of this, thank you, Lucy. And uh, we continue at 4 p.m., so see you later. <laughs>